Father, I'll begin by asking you to give us your name. I am Jim Reuter of the Society of Jesus. Arthur Francis Shea. Bill Kreutz. Edmundo Martinez. Francis X. Clark. John Krebs. Luigi Moji. Arthur Andrew Bauer. Miguel Anselmo Bernat. My name is uh, Honesto. My middle name is Chavez. And his name Pagana. I'm Roque Angel. Okay, Father, once again, I'll ask you to give me your full name. Roque Angel Ferriols y Jamias. That's my full name. My full name is Roque Angel Ferriols y Jamias. My mother's family name is Jamias, and I have two baptismal names, Roque Angel. But how long have you been uh, a Jesuit? Well, I entered in May 30th, 1941, so that's more or less 57 years. Can you tell us about that day when you first entered the Novitiate? Well, I had received a letter from the Mission Superior telling me to show up on May 30th, 1941 at Sacred Heart Novitiate, uh, Novaliches, and to give that letter to the Novice Master, Father, Father uh, Vincent Canali. And so it should be in time for supper, so I figured that meant 6 o'clock. So I was getting ready, we were getting ready to go to Novaliches at home. And uh, my father, my mother, my sisters were saying, let's go now. And I would say, it's only 1.30 in the afternoon and I'm, I have to be there at 6, so it's too early. So anyhow, we had compromised, we left, not as late as I wanted to leave, but not as early as they wanted to leave. And at that time, at that time, uh, the Sacred Heart Novitiate was far away from the city. It's not like now where it's a part of the city, no. But at that time, it was far away from the city. And we went through country, country scenery. And it was raining. And uh, the street going to the Sacred Heart Novitiate was a dirt road. So I remember the last thing I would see of the world, so as to use terminology which is popular in those days, I saying, this is the last thing I'll see of the, of the world, a muddy road with grass on both sides. So then we reached Novaliches, and there were the other people who were entering with me. We were 12 who entered on that day, May 30th, 1941. And in those days, the parents and friends stayed outside, and only the men were allowed to enter because it was supposed to be strict cloister so the angel took my father and me and brought us upstairs to the chapel and walked around the red tiles of the corridor going around the chapel and then we brought down my father to the entrance where he rejoined the rest of the family and we said goodbye that was it not like now where we have a program and you have speeches and you have jokes. In those days, that was all. That was it. And then after that, the angel brought me to the refectory where there was merienda. I remember it was a cake with chocolate icing, which gave some encouragement. <laughs> so, and then that was the beginning of the third probation. I came there dressed in my usual clothes, which is long khaki pants and a khaki shirt, but then they said you have to have an Americana. So there was a common room there with all kinds of 
strange looking Americanas and I brought, uh, was told to wear one of them. The, the, that was supposed to be our formal dress in the novitiate until the end of the first probation when we were given habit day. So we had our first probation where we had ludi or games every day, swimming every day for the first six days and getting conferences from the angels. And then six day retreat from Father Socius who was Father Carol Facey. And it was very rainy during those six days, that six day retreat. And then one night there was uh, the Simut Simut, these flying ants. We were piously praying in the first probationer's acetory when this big cloud of flying ants came in. And uh, we did all kinds of things. Somebody brought in a basin with water and held it up to the light so that the flying ants would fall into the water. And in short, our retreat silence was broken. And when the incident was finished, when the flying ants were no longer flying, we were all afraid the novice master might postpone our habit day because we broke silence during our retreat. The novice master was Father Vincent Canali. And, uh, but I th thought probably not because the next day I, w I came to see him about distractions in prayer. And he said, oh, these distractions in prayer are just like the flying ants last night, he said. <laughs> Excuse me, Father, just change back. So, Father, may I ask you about your experiences in the novitiate when the war broke out? Maybe you can tell us the first day when you first heard about the war. The first day of the war was December 8, 1941. By the way, when I said I entered the society, did I say 41 or 40? I think 41. Yeah, because it, I might have said, if I said 40, that was wrong. It should be 41. So, on December 8, 1941 was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and according to the liturgy of those days we had the solemn high mass in Latin and it was uh, usually in novelitches, especially for young novices, the solemn high mass is always an impressive and emotional experience, especially for such a big feast. And after that, since it was a holiday, we had holiday order, so we went to the triclinium or to the refectory to fix it up and after that we were supposed to have games. And while we were doing the triclinium, there were whispers going around, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. And is that true? Is that not true? But we went on uh, cleaning up the tables and setting the tables for the next meal. And then we went out to play basketball. And Father Facey, the socius, went out. The novice master, Father Canali, had, been, had gone to Culion for a one-month stay there but he did not know that he was going to become stuck there because of the war and it would take him nine months to come back. So, and neither did we know that. We just went out to the basketball court. The, the basketball court we have now in the back of Novaliches, of the novitiate in Novaliches, that same basketball court. And uh, Father Facey sat down on a bench and uh, we were all gathered around him. Uh, Is it true the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor? If it's true, will that be war? And he said, well, it's true they had bumped Pearl Harbor, but we don't know yet. We don't know yet if the war, if it's going to mean war. Perhaps some crazy pilot just thought he would bump Pearl Harbor. That showed how little we knew about it. And uh, after basketball, we went down to swim in the swimming pool. And when we were swimming, it was, I remember the wind was cold, it was December. And the manual doctor came running down the stairs and he said, all, everybody get dressed and go to the conference room. Father Socius wants to give us a conference. So we all went upstairs, got dressed, and went to the conference room and Father Facey said, as you know, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Since then they have bombed the following places, Apari, Clarkfield, Davao, and he mentioned some other places. So, as you can see, there's war. There's, that means war. And then he gave us a few instructions on what to do. Uh, and that the instructions would go on after that. But we went on with the novice order, but there were a number of things we were asked to do, like uh, 
camouflage the house by cutting branches of trees from behind to put it on top of the roof of the house and make a mixture of mud and water to paint the house. I really don't know if that did any good, but I think what that did for, for us was it gave us something to do, but the novice order went on. We had, as usual, meditation, we had uh, spiritual reading, we had points for meditation, which the novice master, in this case now, the acting novice master, gave three times a week. And uh, from time to time there would be air raids and the planes would fly over Manila, over the novitiate building, with a sound which I thought res resembled the buzzing of bees. We'd see the planes flying and rather high. And then they would go over Manila and then we would see them circling over Manila because in those days Manila was far away from Novaliches and here the bombs falling. And then after a while there was a procedure whenever the, the, there's an air raid, somebody rings the, the bell and when the bell is rung, each one has a part of the building where it's in theory anyhow was supposed to be safe because Father Facey read somewhere that the corner of a concrete building is safer, so each one had the corner into which he was supposed to go. So uh, my corner was the one right near the entrance, which says, until now, it says AMDG 1932, I think it says there. So I, I was in that corner, and uh, I would look out, and there was a garden outside right in front of the novitiate, which had poinsettias, which were blooming red at that time because it was December. And so I'll just be thinking, there are planes flying above, and there's beautiful red flowers below, and Christmas is coming. And then I was telling myself, will I ever have a kind of life in which I can walk out without being afraid that a bomb might fall any time because there was a certain psychological effect on me that I was afraid that when I'm walking outside a bomb might fall because one never can tell when a plane would fly out there above you and it, the bomb might fall. And so on December 24th, oh, we, we have hurriedly put up some kind of Christmas decorations but the Secundi were telling us that in past years they had beautiful decorations, but now and uh, we didn't even have a time to put up a regular Belen, so we just put up several, uh, several levels of wood in the table on the chapel and covered it with a blue cloth and put the figures of the Belen uh, on top of the different layers of wood. And then of course, every evening was, every, at night it was always blackout. There were no lights. Before that we had had practice blackouts, but this was the real thing, no lights. And one of the first things the novice master told us to do was to write home, to assure our parents it was okay, and I was wondering to myself, uh, I just wonder what, whether these letters will reach home, just how, what will happen in this war that's going on. But we wrote home, in a blackout, we would be huddled around table lamps with a, which were hooded with black, black uh, paper, and we would be writing our letters there. So, and we would be walking through the corridors in a blackout, and uh, there are plenty of fireflies in Avaliches, and Brother Alingal, who's our secundi, caught a firefly and put it because we were always wearing habits in those we were always wearing habits in those days. So he put it in the pocket of his habit. And so whenever he walks you, you could see the firefly uh, the light of the firefly flickering. So many of us did that. We'd be walking through the corridors with the firefly in our habit pocket so we won't hopefully won't be bumping into each other. So on December twenty fourth uh, there was a conference of Father Facey. He says, points. And he says, so in the darkness you could hear his voice. I mean, he says, before I give the points, I would like to tell you something that uh, 
the Japanese are approaching Manila and the um, Allied forces have declared Manila an open city. So our superiors have decided that tomorrow, Christmas Day, we should all go to Manila and leave Novaliches. So, but we're going to have our midnight mass here this, this tonight and have the three masses, one right after the other at midnight. And then tomorrow morning, he said, at 4 o'clock, we shall all uh, leave, we'll go, go walking to Manila through Intramuros. Uh, now, what was Intramuros? At that time, Intramuros meant the ruins of the Ateneo, which burned, Ateneo had, where Rizal had studied, had burned down in 1932. But it left behind ruins and part of the ruins was partially built up for the Ateneo grade school would uh, have its uh, quarters. So in Ateneo grade school, well, to begin again from the very beginning. Uh, I just asked you to, to, to move your chair. It sounds okay. okay. The Ateneo used to be in Intramuros, that, that's Ateneo where Rizal was. And there was an old building, then there was a bridge across the street and then behind it, uh, across the bridge, uh, there was the, where the Jesuits lived, uh, they called it the mission house and the beautiful church uh, with wood carvings of San Ignacio. Now the fire of 1932 burnt just the Ateneo and the Ateneo transferred to Padre Faura. But then uh, I think around 1938 or so, they built over part of the ruins of the Ateneo and the grade school, which was in Padre Fara, transferred to Intramuros. I don't know if it was the whole grade school or part of it. And so when the night of Christmas, or Christmas Eve, Father Faisi said we'll go to Intramuros, he meant that, that grade school part of Intramuros, which was closed already since the war began, the Ateneo closed, closed shop, so to speak. And uh, so he, he said, we shall walk tomorrow at 4 o'clock, we shall walk to Manila. And so tonight, he said, after points, of course in the dark, because it was a blackout, prepare just a laundry bag for, for the, whatever can fit into a laundry bag. And so just what you think is necessary, just bring that with you. And so, then after that, they gave points for Christmas, which was, for many of us, our first Christmas in the society was a rather emotional experience, thinking that we would have to walk tomorrow, beginning at four o'clock. And so that night, we went to the chapel, and we had no lights except the six lighted candles, and uh, six lighted candles on the altar, and we had three masses, one right after the other. We sang Christmas carols, because uh, part of the preparation for Christmas was to memorize Christmas carols so we could sing it in the blackout. And I remember the last hymn we sang was uh, Adeste Fidelis and we had a rousing Venite Adoremus at the end of it. And then we went to bed. And then when I woke up the next day, uh, when we woke up, there was a bell in the, oh, excuse me, I forgot to say this that before the midnight mass, they had the traditional carol singing, which was supposed to be a surprise for the primi. So even with the war, we had, I think that was one of the things which kept us going and kept us from becoming crazy during the war, that we had the time order that we followed strictly and as strictly as we could. Of course, sometimes there would be an air raid or that there, there would be a house search by the Japanese or something we did not foresee. And so we, especially towards the end when there was a lot of bombing in Manila. But that's, I'm, I'm getting ahead of my story. But what I meant to say was we had a time order which we tried to follow and did follow as closely as we could. And now when I look back on it, I think, and we believe in the time order. We didn't just have a time order to follow up mechanically, but we believed in the simplicity of our hearts that it was God's will. And looking back on it, I think that one can say psychologically that kept us from going crazy, and I think spiritually that kept us 
somehow holding on to God in the midst of, of uh, whatever was going on. But to go back to Christmas, we, before the Midnight Mass, we Primi were woken up by the strains of the people singing and and then uh, they just arranged their songs in such a way that when it was time to wake up, uh, a bell rang for waking up for Midnight Mass and uh, the song would say, fall on your knees. And in those days, when you woke up during the office, the first thing you did was to kneel and kiss the floor and stretch out your hands and offer the day to God. That was the, you want, we, we might call it a liturgy of waking up in the novice ship in those days. So that was it. That, uh, that was moving for us that when the people sang Fall on Your Knees, it was just time for us to get out of bed and kneel down and kiss the floor. So anyhow, but as I, I'm afraid the order of my story is all mixed up. But uh, then we had the three masses, and then we went back to bed, and then the bell rang the next morning. As soon as the bell rang, although it was still dark, I knew it was not four o'clock. And I knew that something must have happened to change plans. So I, when the bell rang, and again, we again knelt down and kissed the floor, and, and then we heard the manager, the manager doctor's voice. This is the time order for today, he said. It is now five o'clock. So I said to myself, I, I knew it was not four o'clock. It is now five o'clock. We just follow normal holiday order. You shall be given uh, instruction. instructions later. So we, we went to the chapel, paid the morning visit. That was the usual holiday order and had the one hour meditation. And then we had Christmas breakfast, and Father Facey told us that he decided that the novices were not going to walk to Intramuros because uh, this was for many, for most of us, except for our secundi, we had only four secundi, and the primi were 19 by then. So he said, for most of you, this is your first Christmas in the society, and uh, I would like you to stay as long as possible in the novitiate, in this novitiate house. So uh, he said he had called up the Ateneo, and the Ateneo would send the Blue Eagle bus. At that time, the Ateneo had one bus which, were, which had the Blue Eagle. Actually, it was not blue, it was brown, but anyhow, it was called the Blue Eagle bus. So he said they'd call up the train and they would send the Blue Eagle bus. And uh, so he said, just keep up your normal holiday order. But if the Blue Eagle bus arrives, the bell will ring. And uh, you if you're not dressed up, dress up. That meant to say, put on your habit and everything. And take your laundry bag and go to the bus and we'll go to Intramuros. So we ha had the no normal order. We even got Christmas dinner, I remember. The dessert was chocolate ice cream. So the, although the war had begun, the ice box was still working. The ice box was a room. Until now, it's, it's a room, isn't it? Yes. So there was uh, the ice box there. The, we had chocolate ice cream. And then, again, as per normal holiday order, we went to siesta, and while we were having a siesta, the bell rang. And we got dressed up, took our laundry bags, and went to the Blue Eagle bus, and the Blue Eagle bus drove us to Intramuros. Now, who were in Intramuros? Because at that time, when we entered the novitiate in Novaliches, there was, uh, in that house were staying the three years of philosophy and the two years of junior age, so it was a very big community. So, and then also there were some seminarians from San Jose Seminary who were not able to go home, and they uh, stayed in, uh, in with us in Novaliches during the first days of the war. So they were the ones who went walking to, Man to Manila, 
But later on, when we got to know Intramuros, they told us the story that there were some army trucks, empty army trucks, going to Manila, coming from they don't know exactly where. And the army trucks gave them a, a, a ride until Manila, so they didn't walk all the way to Manila. They, they got a ride anyhow, and they were able to get to Intramuros. So going to Manila now, but now I'm back to the novices, the noon of Christmas day going to Manila. And for many of us who came from Manila, this was an exciting time because for seven months we were in Novaliches in, so to speak, a strange religious house with bells ringing and now we were going home. <laughs> and uh, we could see sandbags on the street, on the street corners. And, uh, but things looked pretty much the same. But there were these air raid sirens, which were already in place even when we entered in a, at the time of our entrance, because there was already much talk of war and preparation for war. So the air raid si sirens were not anything new for us, because before we entered, there were already air raid sirens. But what was new was they would all be blasting at the same time whenever there, there were any Japanese planes flying above. And uh, that could be nerve-wracking um, before one got, until one got used to it. Anyhow, we went to Intramuros, and that night, Father, Christmas night, Father Colum, Leo Colum, gave us points. And what did he say? He used the introit for the midnight mass, quare fremuar and quare fremuar and gentes at Regis meditati sunt inania. Why have the why have the Gentiles raged and the kings meditated vain things? Something like that. So, he said now nowadays when we are out of fear for so many things, out of fear for our very lives, it's hard to think. It's hard to realize that all these things are inania. And we all burst out laughing when he said that. Yeah. Stray memory, which I'm sharing. <laughs> I don't know exactly if it's terribly important, but I did remember that. And so that night, they gave us each, each we were divided into groups, and each one found some place to sleep in the classrooms and uh, in the classrooms and we were sleeping on the floor so we took out our laundry bags and took out whatever clothes there I remember I put on my pajamas these were the days when people wore pajamas to sleep so I dressed up and put on my pajamas and uh, put my mosquito net, so now I remember I must have, I brought my mosquito net in my laundry bag uh, and use it as a pillow. But there are plenty of mosquitoes and so the bomb, while we were sleeping we would hear the, the bombers flying over the port area and uh, dropping bombs and we had heard bombs when we were in the villages but this is the first time that we were hearing bombs being dropped right close to us and the bombs would fall with a rattling sound. We would hear the planes probably circling, at least just trying to guess from the sound. And then the rattling sound, and then I, I'm guessing, perhaps there was something about the way their tails were made so that they would rattle as they fell, probably to f frighten people, because I had read about, in Europe they had whistle bombs, bombs which whistle as they fell to have a psychological effect of frightening people. So I was thinking, perhaps now they have rattling bombs. You hear the rattle and then the, f the explosion. And then, uh, so the sleep was rather troubled. And then I would peep out the window and I would see against the wall the, I would see flicker of fires. So I said, there are fires now going on somewhere here. And then there are plenty of mosquitoes, and our, we had Secundi there 
Brother Lopez and Brother Lagutin and Brother Chan and Brother Alingal. And I remember Brother Lopez saying, these mosquitoes, these mosquitoes, they are worse than bombers. <laughs> and uh, Father, Brother Lagutin was suggesting, well, if you have some alcohol and cotton, why don't you wipe it on the mosquito bites? <laughs> or, so that's a strange converse. So, uh, w did you stay in the in the in Intramuros the whole time during the war years, Father? No, we just stayed there overnight from the 25th to the 26th. And I was telling about the bombs and the mosquitoes. That was the night from the 25th to the 26th. So the next day in the morning, we all throughout the war, the superiors always had some logistics of keeping us fed. Of course, sometimes very well fed, sometimes not so well fed, but we were, most of the time we were fed anyhow, somehow. And so we had breakfast and lunch there. And then we were told, now you walk to Padre Faura. And from Intramuros, you just had to cross a field and then go through, uh, I think this name of the street was Florida, and then go straight to Padre Faura. But this time we had to come out of the gates of Intramuros and uh, while we were crossing the field, sound, there was a flight of Japanese planes. So I remember I ran to under one of the palm trees and went flat on my face, hoping that the leaves would <laughs> keep me hidden from the planes. But they didn't drop any, any, they did not strafe, they did not drop bombs, they just flew over. But I remember they flew over rather low. You could look up, you could see see the planes rather clearly. And then we we walked through, at least the group I was with walked across the field. Another group did not come out through that gate, but they went through the inside of Intramuros and passed by Lourdes Church. And there, there was a, an American armed force, either a soldier or a, or a sailor or a what, and he saw one of my fellow novices and, and he said, I have a brother just like you back home. And anyhow, we got to the Ateneo in Pardo Fara. The Ateneo wasn't running, the school wasn't running. So we had our novitiate there. For, uh, so beginning December 26, 1941, until July, I can't remember the exact date of July, or it might have been either June 30th or July 1st, probably, 1943. The novices stayed in, novices and juniors and philosophers stayed at Ateneo Pandrafara, the building of Ateneo Pandrafara, because the Ateneo wasn't running anymore. And also the Philippine mission kept San Jose Seminary going. The Ateneo was closed, but San Jose Seminary was was still uh, in operation. So we went to, so the dates I gave was December 26, 1941, until probably June 30th or July the 1st, 1943. So you can see from the dates that we finished our novice ship there and took uh, at least the batch which entered on May 30th, took our vows on May 31st, 1943, in the Ateneo building in Padre Faura. And uh, we were 12 who, took our, who entered, but only 11 of us took our vows on that day because one of us, Father Mal who, the, who was then Brother Malasmas, but who is Father Malasmas now, caught the chicken pox. So his, when we were all taking our vows, he was in uh, quarantine, so to speak. And uh, he took his vows on June 16th, 1942. So he took his vows 16 days later on, on what was then the feast of St. John Francis Regis. But what was our life like in Padre Faura? Well, the, big, the first big thing that happened was the Japanese entered the city on January the 1st, 1942. And uh, 
the novices were occupying one of the borders, what had been the do borders dormitory. And uh, it, would, it would be dormitory style life where just have a big open room. As a matter of fact, even in Avalice, so there's this style, the dormitory style, a big open room with all the beds lined up there. So I remember waking up at night, the night of New Year's, and hearing hub, hub-nailed boots going up the stairs. And uh, because right close to what had been the Borders Dormitory, but which was now the Novices Dormitory, there was the Weather Bureau, which was run by Jesuits in those days. And so apparently they were going into the Weather Bureau. I, I woke up, and I suppose many of my fellow novices woke up too. But none of us talked to anybody. We just didn't make, give, give any sign that we were conscious. But and nobody entered, you know, the dormitory. But you could hear it on that uh, stairwell right close. There were people wearing hobnail boots going up and then going down. And when we woke up the next day, we knew the Japanese had occupied Manila. But before the Japanese had occupied Manila, when the American and Filipino armed forces were leaving Manila, they burnt anything which could be burnt so that the Japanese won't use it. So they burnt the oil, uh, oil supplies of Pandakan, and every once in a while an oil uh, tank would explode and the sky would be full, filled with a kind of a lurid red. At night you could during the day, it's just black smoke, but at night it'd be a lurid red glow. So, yeah, we, we knew that the armed forces... Did you change battery? Mm -hmm. You can go to that a little bit later. Father. Yeah. Okay. So, Father, you were saying that uh, the Japanese... That's me, yeah? That's right. <laughs> so, you were saying that the Japanese had entered the world city and... The, the, burning the oil before the Japanese entered. The Americans yeah. were burning the oil before the Japanese entered. And so, I don't know, I, I, I'm af afraid that I mixed up the That's time order. Like the yeah. And uh, where were we? The uh, Americans and Filipinos, some Phil American forces were, you suffer. United States Armed Forces of the Far East, and you see, you suffer. And what else? The Philippine scouts had retired to Bataan, and they were going to defend Bataan and Corregidor. As a matter of fact, they, I think they defended Bataan until April and, and Corregidor until May, if I'm not mistaken, 19, both in 1942. And during all that time, we were already in under Japanese occupation. And. Uh, so we had our novice shape. There was a moment of relative quiet. I say relative because many of us had friends or relatives who were in Bataan, or, and then later on after Bataan fell and Corregidor fell, we had them in the guerrillas. And uh, many were, well, some had died. and. Uh, also, there was a fellow novice who entered with us, Teddy Arvisu, and uh, he ended up in Bataan, and uh, he took part in the death march, and uh, he was able to to be freed from. Uh, after the death march, he was in Capas, and then he was made uh, one of the servants. Uh, some of the, apparently, I, I don't know exactly how this happened, but he was uh, like one of the servers in a Japanese officer's place. And this was all the time when we were still novices. And one evening during, during the points or a conference for the face, he told us, I just got a word from Brother Arvisu, and how I got word from him, let us not talk about it. 
because in, th in those days you had to be careful what you talked about and also it was very often better not to know not only for your own sake but for the sake of other people so you could really say you don't know where they are but he said he got word from brother Arvisu and he said the, the note just said see what you can do for the men in Kapas that's for the men who are still in the Kapas prison camp but later on years after the war Father Ga, who was Brother Ga in those days, a fellow novice in those days, said that he and Father Facey had gone f to a certain building in Isaac Paral Street, which is now the United Nations Avenue. And they were able to peep through the window and saw Teddy Arvisu serving some Japanese officers at table with his head shaven and Teddy Arvisu saw they were wearing their habits. In those days, we always wore our habits outside. Teddy Arvisu saw them, and so he had a piece of paper with, wrapped around a stone, and he, he threw it out the window, and it fell in the sidewalk. And that was how they got the word, that, that word which Father Facey told us he had from Teddy Arvisu. That's how they got it, from a stone which the paper wrapped around it. But uh, in those days, the Feast of All the Saints of the Society was on November the 6th. Uh, and November the 5th was the Feast of the Relics in Our Houses. So on November the 5th, 1942, Teddy Arvisu re-entered the novitiate. And I was, by that time I was a secundi, and I, it happened I was in charge of the refectory at that time. And so I saw him enter with the angels. And he was entering the society a second time. And uh, so our batch considers him a member of our year. But our primi consider him a member of their year. So whenever people talk about the number of Jesuits, Arvisu always gets counted twice because we count him with us and our primi count him with the counts him as one of them. But for, from 1942 on, there was a time of relative peace, relative quiet. One had to be always very careful. Even if you're walking in the street, you must be careful what you're talking about because there are many stories of sometimes the secret police will just stop you and separate you and ask you separately Let's say A and B are talking, the secret police catches them, they'll separate them and ask A, have A in one corner, in one part of the street and B in the other part where they cannot give any signals to each other and ask each of them, what were you talking about? So that never happened to me or I don't know anyone to whom that happened. But there were stories going around that that kind of thing can happen. And so at any rate, uh, one, has, we were always, at least I did, I always felt very strange whenever I was walking outside. I can't even talk freely because one never can tell. And then if you pass by a Japanese sentry, you're supposed to salute him. And if you don't salute him, he can punish you by making you stand in the sun. And I know some scholastics who told stories like that, that they were made to stand in the sun. So whenever I'm walking on the street and I see a Japanese sentry, I quietly cross the street uh, and pass, uh, make myself as small as possible and just walk by because I didn't want to bow. But on one occasion there was, the sentry saw me and he began thumping his rifle on the floor and saying something in Japanese which I couldn't understand. So I just, pretended not to hear him and went on walking quietly and hoping he won't do anything. And he did not do anything. <laughs> and, but then I, so we had incidents like that and then we would have members of our family being brought to Fort Santiago or something like that. And then the I'm afraid. I'm having mucus coming. <laughs> <laughs> it is 
you can talk about the when you were a junior father and the, what, 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 what did you have to do with regard to the bodies in the streets? Ah, yes. Well, when we were juniors, most of us took our, because in those days, it's not like now where everybody enters on May 30th. In our batch, 12 entered May 30th, and then others entered at different times. And also as times passed by, a number of us, a number of them left the society and uh, left the novitiate and then later on left as juniors. So on, after we had taken our vows, the Japanese took over the main building of the, what had been the Atenea and Padre Faura. And so the Virgin Novices and the juniors were, they took that over. The, there were some bungalows which were, used to be the laboratories of the Ateneo. And uh, so the philosophers were allowed to continue staying there. And then the theologians were, went to different places. The Paules father, the Vincentian fathers, gave them quarters at San Marcelino. But then the Japanese took that building over, so then they went to San Agustin. And then I do not know exactly what happened because I was a junior by that time. So we were in juniors and novices went to Lake Nasciana. And there, we were searched, but by that time, Father Canali had come back. It took him 11 months to come back. So he had come back, and he was already our novice master when we took our vows. And uh, so when we were there, he was there. And we were searched by the Japanese many times. And our, the one teaching us in the junior aid, a great teacher, I think, one of the greatest teachers I ever had was Father Joseph Mallory. And he was one of those who were, uh, because there were some photographs in his room. Uh, way back in 1922, he says, there was an earthquake in Tokyo. And uh, I think, I don't know if he was a priest or a scholastic. They had photographs of the earthquake and they used it in America to earn money to give to the earthquake victims in Tokyo. But he had kept the pictures and so they had it in his room, and the, when the Japanese would search the building, we would all, at bayonet point, we were all had to go to the front part of the building while they went through the rooms. And uh, so they, they saw Father Mallory's pictures, and so they made that grounds for bringing him to Fort Santiago. And another priest staying with us was Father Doucette, and when the war broke out, he thought this is going to be a historical thing. So he kept a diary of the war. So the Japanese saw that in his room, and they also brought him to Fort Santiago. So Father, they were eventually released, but not until they were, uh, the, for a long time they were, I, I think Father Mulgrave was three weeks, I'm not sure, might have been longer. But what happened was that Father Doucette, they accused him of being a spy because of the diary he kept, which showed that they were not very intelligent. <laughs> if they could accuse him of being a spy for the diary he kept. And Father Mulry, they said, Father Mulry later on told us this story. They said, uh, you are using those photographs of ruins in Tokyo to give, uh, to give lectures about how the Japanese, the Americans are, are bombing Tokyo. And of course we had no news at all about what is going on outside. So he said that he asked them, why have they been bombing Tokyo? <laughs> and, but then he said the young Japanese who was assigned to him looked at those photographs and that young Japanese was uh, working, before he became, the army got him, was working for a photographer. And so he knew those photographs. So he told his, his superiors, I know those photographs. They are photographs of the Tokyo earthquake in 1922. And so they asked him, what were you doing with these photographs? Well, he said, when, when the earthquake took place in 1922, I, 
Father McNeil, I think, and, my, and himself, they went around America giving lectures, collecting money for the earthquake victims. And so the uh, Japanese apologized. I'm, I'm sorry for causing you all this trouble, and I thank you for, for having uh, that, done much to help these people in 1922. But he was not yet released, so then sometime later, this young Japanese who was who had recognized the photograph, saw him still there, and uh, so the Japanese went to the whoever was on top and said, "Why have you not released my prisoner? He should, he's not guilty. He should be released." So, but what was the what was the detention like in Fort Santiago? Well, Father Canali, Father Mallory said it was a room. And I do not know exactly, I can't remember now the dimensions he gave, or if he gave any dimensions, but the picture I have in my memory from the way he described it was probably as big as this room. Or, and he said they, there was a, they all had to sit down quietly and there was an electric bulb on all the time so that you don't know if it's day or night. Uh, and. Uh, You don't know if it's day or night, but, but excuse me. I said that you don't know if it's day or night, but that's just an interpretation of mine. He just said there was a light which was on, but then they would sleep. Also, in a corner there was a uh, uh, like a big pail, and that's where they did their toilet necessities. Uh, and they just slept on the floor. And sometimes at night there would be some guerrilla caught and they would just throw him into the room and his body would fall on their bodies. He said, but he said his fellow prisoners were very kind to him. They respected him as a priest. Like he said, when he would use the pail as his toilet, they would all not look because he was a priest and they respected him. And there was a Chinese who knew massage. And so at night before they went to sleep, this Chinese would give him a massage so that his body would relax and he would be able somehow to sleep. And uh, then one of the prisoners brought in was Horatio de la Costa. And de la Costa did not talk too much about this, but this part I got, we got from Father Mallory. He said, well, Horatio is a very high-strung personality. Well, well, he's a genius, and I think that's part of it, that he was rather high-strung. High and they're supposed to be sitting down all the time, and, and Horatio couldn't stand just sitting down all the time without moving. So he would sometimes take a chance and stand up and walk on the corridor outside the room. And sometimes they won't catch him. But sometimes but once they caught him and they just heard Father Mulry said <coughs> they heard them They heard, they, heard, they heard them bring him to the end of the corridor and, and hit him, perhaps with the butt of a rifle or something. So he said, then they brought him back to the room and he was black and blue from the beating he got. But he said, Father Mulry said, by the way, when Father De La Costa was in college, Father Mulry was his teacher. So Father Marley said, and the boy spoke never a word. He, he didn't make any noise. He said nothing. He just came in and sat down quietly. So then now we're to the point. So that, that's the kind of detention Father, Father Mulry and Father De La Costa underwent. And might as well, I think this is the place to, later on, Father De La Costa was out of the 
was also released, but after Father Mulry. And uh, the only story he told us about his being in Fort Santiago was that there was a guerrilla brought in there who was a messenger, a young boy who was a messenger for the guerrillas. And they caught, and he was very fast. And the guerrillas called him Lamp because he, he had very bright eyes. And uh, he was very fast, he was not, they couldn't, the Japanese couldn't catch him, but finally they caught him and they brought him. And from the torture he became limp, he was limping. But Father de la Costa said, the, the lamp would always tell him, when I get out, I will go back to the guerrillas. We must not allow them to think we are defeated. So that was, it was the only story I heard Father Telecosta tell about his stay in Fort Santiago. But that story about him being beaten up, I got that from Father Mul Mulry. And uh, so Father Mulry finally, because of this young Japanese who would work with the photographer, he was released. And he came walking out of Fort Santiago. And at that time, the San Ignacio was still in operation. And there was a brother that was still in operation. So let's now go with Father Mallory. He's walking out of Fort Santiago. He's walking outside the city walls. And later on, we'll go to San Ignacio. And he said that, how did he look like? Well, he, he, was, he got his white habit back, but it was not in a very good condition. And uh, he said two-thirds of him left the society. See, he was a very fat person. And when he was in Fort Santiago, he became very thin. So jokingly, he said, two-thirds of me left the society. And also, I remember one somebody asked him, what were you doing during all that time when you were just sitting down there in the, in the room? Well, he said, I made the spiritual exercises. He said, there was nothing to do. So when you have nothing to do, he said, you fall back on your spirituals. So he said he made, was making the spiritual exercises where he was in Fort Santiago. And he said, of course, there was no shaving, he said. And I had a beard, beautiful auburn color, he said. So anyhow, when he got into Santiago, Brother Dio was at the door. When he went to, rather, to San Ignacio, Brother Dio was at the door. And Brother Dio looked him up and down. He was trying to figure out who this thin, beard had dirty man was. And then after a certain point, Brother Dear recognized him and, oh, oh Father Mallory, and embraced him. So he was there for some time, some time before he was allowed by the superiors, who the superiors figured he was recovered enough to, to return to La Ignaciana in Santa Ana and teach us. Uh, continue teaching as the junior aide. And as I said before, I say it again, he's one of the greatest teachers I, I ever sat under. And even if after, after, and under such terrible circumstances where he would be, ab where he was absent because he was in Fort Santiago, he still, uh, he woke up our minds. I think that was the biggest thing he did to me. He woke up my mind. And uh, then we had a big flood and uh, I remember at the end of the, when we were getting towards the end of the school year, uh, he said, uh, my dear brothers, he said, this school year with floods and nets and chains, nets and chains, of course, is a quotation from the spiritual exercises <laughs> where Satan sends out his followers. So my brothers, he said, this, this year with floods and nets and chains, it, won't, it, would, it won't be very strange if we didn't get too much rhetoric done. 
but we did get a lot of rhetoric. That was a year of rhetoric, so a year of rhetoric then. Okay. So that was... Change. Yeah, I could see that. It's nicer outdoors. And also, you could pick a nice scenery. The problem with the Athena is always the noise. Yeah. Except on a Sunday. It's a major army, so must they meet them. Okay, Father, let's, quit. let's go on. So in, in July 1944, no, excuse me, my first year junior grade was school year 43 to 44. And then my second year junior grade was 44 to 45. And around June or July of, or July of 1944, the Japanese took all the Americans who were not yet in concentration camps, they all took them, picked them up and brought them to Los Banos concentration camp. And that was when De La Costa became our teacher. And uh, again, he's, that's why I was thinking when I entered the society, it was in my first two years of training where I got two of the greatest teachers I ever had. And uh, for which were Father Mulray and Father De La Costa. And uh, so that, that was when Father De La Costa gave us the story about Lamp. This was in, more or less, he began teaching us and Father, when Father Mallory was brought to the concentration camp in around July 1944. And then September 1944, that was the beginning of the Battle of Manila. The Americans began bombing Manila. And uh, we would have classes, but then when there would be an air raid, we would have call off classes. So. It was kind of irregular, but as I had said before, we always kept up the schedule as regularly as we could. And we still had learned a lot of the junior grade course, Latin, Greek, and English. And we still had put on our small plays and everything. But finally, in February 1945, the Americans entered, began entering Manila. We did not know they were entering Manila. We just heard a lot of shooting and saw a lot of flares. It was February 3rd. And then later on we heard we, that the, the Americans had entered. And later on we found out that that was February the 3rd when they went to UST because there were also Americans interned there. They reached Santa Ana where we were on February the 9th. So that showed you how how great the fire, how, how how terrible the fighting was. It took them from February 3rd to February the 9th to reach Santa Ana. And the Americans reached Lake Nashana, Santa Ana in the afternoon of February the 9th. And they had fighting all along Paco, Ermita, Malate, and it took them several days. So the Scholastics who were in Padre Faura, they began filtering in to La Ignaciana. I don't know how long, perhaps it took them about three, two to three weeks to filter in gradually. And two scholastics were killed. And uh, there were some people who were wounded but who recovered. And then after that, there was still fighting going on, but it had relatively quieted down. And you know, throughout the fighting of Manila, I just saw one American corpse. And I saw him in an ambulance already being given away because the Americans took away their dead bodies as fast as possible. But uh, there were many Filipino and Japanese corpses in the city, and so there were some people ask, some Jesuits ask, would it be possible if we buried the dead bodies because there were flies and all kinds of things and it might spread disease. So the juniors were, were asked. And there were two burial crews they took. We alternated and one day would be this crew and the next day would be the next crew. And uh, 
So that was not what we did. We were burying dead bodies. It would be mostly in uh, Paco, Singalong, and uh, there was a time when we went to the Vincentian Church in San Marcelino because ten of them had been shot by the Jap by the Japanese who were lined up on the Estero or this Creek, the small Estero there. It's still there as far as I you know. And shot and bayoneted and they their bodies were were soaking in the water for perhaps one week before we got there. And we gathered them up and put them in a, what looked like there was an, a, a, a chaplain, an American chaplain with us there and was telling us what would be a good place to bring them. There was a place there which I round place with uh, water in the bottom. They put stones there and, and then put galvanized, galvanized iron. And put the dead bodies one by one, which were already in an advanced state of decomposition. And there were some essentials there trying to identify the bodies. And, uh, but the other places would be in Singalong, some, sometimes civilians, sometimes, uh, sometimes Japanese soldiers. And, uh, Just some detached memories I have. The first time we went out to bury dead bodies, we were juniors, but we had uh, the one, the one theologian scholastic was our senior, so to speak. His name was Araneta. <laughs> so he, there was a, a woman there with a small, uh, like a small, small store, not, not a real store, but a, a, a table by the side of the road. And behind her was San Andres Bukid, which was really Bukid in those days, which was really a country-like place. And there was a, there, there was a, a piece of like ground where they grew grass to feed the horses of the Calesas. There were Calesas in those days. And so she was, she had a table beside it and she was selling fried bananas. So there was still, fighting was, comp was almost finished, but not completely finished. It was still kind of dangerous, but there she was, kind of looking very cheerful and selling fried bananas. And Brother Arneta asked her, Meron po bang mga patay rito ang hindi pa nalilibing? Are there any dead bodies here which have not yet been buried? Well, she said, I have buried my own dead. And she said it very proudly, you know, that she was able to bury her own dead. And then she said, but there is so and so and so and so. And perhaps they have not yet been buried because their relatives are all dead also. So that was the first, the first dead bodies we buried. And we had many others. And I, there was one place there where <coughs> there was a child, a child's body with toys. There was one place in Singalong where all the dead bodies were fallen, facing in one direction, as if they had all been running. And uh, perhaps they were machine gunned because they were all fallen down, but their heads were all in one direction, as if they, they were all fa <laughs> as if they were, they died while running in one direction, and the child had toys scattered around it, as if when it was running around, running away, it was carrying toys with it. No. And some of the dead bodies were. My impression is that the Americans made an attempt to burn some of the bodies to, to prevent uh, spread of disease, but they were too busy fighting to really make a thorough job of it because some of the bodies were burning, but were smoldering from the, as if somebody had sprinkled gasoline on them and lit them, but 
not, was not able to burn them. And I remember one noon time, because the way we would look, we would operate, was we would look uh, for a place where we could dig a grave and bury, or a place where there are many dead bodies, we would look for a place where we could dig a grave. And then we could put all the dead bodies there. And uh, some of, sometimes, uh, at a certain time, Teddy Arviso and I were assigned to, to dig the grave. And this was in a place in Singalong where it was, it was a vacant lot and we were digging. It was very stony ground. And I was thinking to myself, from now on I will think with great respect of grave diggers. They have a hard job. <laughs> And uh, so we were digging it, and it was a very hot day, and there were some banana plants nearby, and nearby was a smoldering corpse. And uh, I was, we were both feeling very tired, and Teddy Arvisu finally suddenly looks up at me and says, don't you notice that smell? I said, yes, I said, it's, it's the burning corpse. He said, don't you notice it smells like crackers? <laughs> and I sniffed and I said, you're right, it smells like crackers. That's just a piece of memory which went, appeared in my, in my strange memory after all these years, so I'm just repeating it. So, how did, how did all these things you think affect you, and how did you? How it's, it's a very difficult thing to go through. How did you manage to to go through it along with the other companions that you had? Well, I don't know exactly. I think years later, several of us would suffer a breakdown or something like that, no? and it might have had some connection with this. But I think it was. Our, our faith, you know, our Catholic faith, really, which sustained us. Uh, and uh, the fact that we were living still in a Jesuit house. After the first bombing of Manila, they were, the superiors told us, we, all those who have vows, let's say the novices stayed on in the novitiate, but those who had vows, which should include the juniors, have permission to live outside the Jesuit house. They can go either to their by themselves to their family or with a, with some fellow Jesuits to their family. The idea was to to spread us to scatter us because if all the Jesuits are in one place and a bomb falls there, there will not be any Jesuits left in the Philippines. So uh, they were. And so we, each we were told to, to pray to, and make a decision, make a, make an, what they used to call in those days an election. Nowadays we would call it a discernment on whether we should go home. We have to make use of that permission to live outside the Jesuit house and to come back to, to the Jesuit house when the fighting is over. And all the juniors, except those who were, all the juniors decided to stay in the, Jesuit house, but some, about five of them who were from Baguio went up to Baguio and they have their own story to tell. But uh, those of us staying in Jesuit house, I think we had this, we had the support of the time order. In those days we had the time order in the house and I think that that, we kept it as closely as we could. Like one of my Beautiful memories is the Christmas of 1944, our last Christmas in wartime conditions. And uh, later on, Joey Guerrero, the famous leper woman who, who was a spy for the guerrillas, she said that uh, then she, she was in the leprosarium. This is after the war. And she asked me, how was your Christmas in 1944, and I said, oh, it was wonderful, it was beautiful. Well, he said, it was uh, Horatio Esfaya de la Costa, who was still a scholastic in those days, told me uh, 
asked me to help him out, said we, he wants to have a good Christmas for the uh, juniors and novices. And uh, I remember we had bananas and uh, suman and uh, I don't know what the right word for it is, but something like molasses which in 1944 was a terrific meal. <laughs> so we had that after the Midnight Mass. But then she said, Horatius asked me, do you think 2,000 pesos is enough? <laughs> and I told him, you don't know what's going on. You can't buy anything for 2,000 <laughs> because the inflation was very high. So. I don't know if that's, I don't think that's the complete answer. God knows the complete answer, but it was one, one factor that we, at least my, the people who were with me, we were living in a Jesuit house with a time order and, you know, with the meditation, prayer, spiritual reading and everything. And we couldn't keep it as uh, completely, but the fact that we were trying to keep it, I think, gave us some something to, something solid to, to hold on to when in between there are moments when things were very difficult where things were or moments when the food would be scarce for example where you don't know if, how long you're going to to be able to stand this physically that kind of thing but there was something you could hold on to all the time something which kept you going which you believed was God's will anyhow with your permission, we'll go a bit forward now and talk mm -hmm. about the Ateneo because as, as far as I know, you spent most of your Jesuit life in the Ateneo. No? Yeah. Perhaps you'd like to share some of the highlights in the history of the Ateneo, uh, some of the, 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 the things that it went through no? as it evolved through the years. Well, I first went to the Ateneo, as I, I begin with the high school because I think that's where, in a way, my vocation was to the society was developed in the high school in the Ateneo, where I was in the Ateneo High School when it was in Padre Faura Street from 1937 to 1941. And at that time, most of the teachers were Jesuit scholastics. And I had some very fine scholastics, Father, G Father Kohler, who was the first Jesuit teacher I ever had, and who I thought was I thought then, and I think even more so now, was a very good example of a Jesuit who just used simply the Jesuit training he had to teach his students as well as he could. And she shared for us very many things which I think, no, I'm not, not I think, I'm sure and now when I think of, of it, up to now, uh, their formative effect on me perjures up to now. And then second year high school, I had Father Lino Banayad, who I think, in a human way, I owe my vocation to him because we became friends and I idolized him. He was my idolo, as they would say nowadays. Yeah, he told me, I told him I want to become a Jesuit. So he asked, what makes you say that? I, I figure, I said, before that I thought I could not become a Jesuit, but when I see that you are a Jesuit, I figure if you can be, I can be. Well, he said, if uh, you want to join the Jesuits because you want to join a group where you will be appreciated and understood, don't join them, he says, because you won't be appreciated, you won't be understood. Especially you, you're a bundle of contradictions, he told me. But if you think that Christ is calling you, okay, he said, Christ is calling you, but he's going to give you a hard time. <laughs> so, well, anyhow, that was the kind of talk Father Banayan had, and I, and I liked him for that. And so, then third year and fourth year, Father Bernard, Father Guerrero, and also a teacher of uh, English was Father Mini. So they were all scholastics in those days. And uh, 
they have all died in the society as priests, except Father Bernard, who's still alive, but who's still. But I mean, say through all the confusion of Vatican II and everything, all those scholastics who taught me when I was young, they all, they all remained faithful to their priesthood and died in the society. And one of them is not yet dead, but he's faithful to his priesthood also. So, so I think when we talk about the Ateneo, I think those people are among the foundation stones of the Ateneo. And, uh, well, when I came to the Ateneo in 1962, it was, uh, you could see it was still a small school, but it was a big school compared to what it was when I was in high school. And I had one year regency in Ateneo. I had two years regency in Samsu Seminary, one year regency in Ateneo de Manila. At that time it was in makeshift quarters in Pandrafaura. It had not yet moved, moved to Loyola Heights. And at that time it was not as big, not as small as it was when I was a student, but it was still a small school. The highlight of the Ateneo then was Father Delaney. When, but I was not under Father Delaney because Father Delaney had just been, there was some, some infighting between Father Delaney and Father Cullum, who was the mission superior. And so he, he was removed from his being principal of the Ateneo High School. So I was not, I, was, I ne had never worked with Father Delaney. But when I was sent to Ateneo for my third year regency, I felt he the, still felt his presence, and uh, his. He had a kind of a mystique of the mass, that the mass was the center of life, and what, what it meant to be a Catholic was that your life revolved around the mass, and uh, so it's very hard to put it into words. But I still felt his presence, and. Uh, he still resided in the Ateneo in Padre Faura in those days, although he was working mostly in the UP. And so I, I had some con conversations with him. I liked him and I think he liked me too. Perhaps I can just sum it up, by, no, not sum it up, but I remember one day it was his birthday and we were having merienda in the refectory and I said, happy birthday, Father. Oh, thank you, he said. And I said, what is the best cheer of your life? And he said, every year. So I said to myself, now that's a good attitude to have. <laughs> so that's one of the things I remember from Father Delaney. But he taught philosophy in the Ateneo, Yeah, in 1962. Well, in 1959, I, was, I finished my, my philosophy degree at Fordham University and I was sent to teach in uh, Cebu and uh, to make a long story short I didn't get along too well with the Dean of Studies in Cebu and so I was I think as one of the solutions on what to do with me you see I in those days in the Catholic school you had to teach St. Thomas and uh, I had studied in Fordham under Father Norris Clark and he, and he had this interpretation of St. Thomas which I thought then and I still think now was more historical and uh, which emphasized the act of existence, the act of to be. And when I went to Cebu, they were using textbooks which had a very conceptualized version of St. Thomas. and. Uh, I wasn't following that, and the one who was the dean in those days, Father O'Shaughnessy said, told the provincial, by that time we had become a province, that I was just confusing the scholastics. And, uh, well, to make a long story short, they solved the problem by sending me to the Ateneo, and Ateneo de Manila in 1962. And so I thought I would keeping the framework which was there in place, do, do it with the, uh, using the, you know, it's such, 
there's so many elements in here it's very hard to speak about it in a coherent way which will do justice to it but I think it was that I tried to give a course of philosophy which would be faithful to the to Saint Thomas and his act of existence the act of to be but in a way which would be which would have the net effect of making the students wake up to their ability to think, their ability to know. That it was not just that you know a thing because you accepted it, nor was it that you know a thing because you don't accept anything, but that you look and try to understand and use your ability to know. In other words, I was trying to make a kind of uh, surroundings within which it's possible for a person to see. To see. And I'd, when I was doing that, I thought that I was sharing what I had learned from Father Mulry. Father Mulry woke me up to my ability to think. And Father De La Costa, which, who woke me up to my ability to use words, to share what I could see and feel and Father Norris Clark, who woke me to the act of to be of, of St. Thomas. So I think looking back at them, I had a kind of a surrounding in which it's possible to see, because to see one needs a, a surrounding, a kind of a horizon, uh, a context, uh, environment, within which things become visible. So that's, I think, through all the somersaults one turns when one teaches, I, it was there one thing I was trying to do. That was the one thing I was trying to do. And there's different subjects involved, different. And that was also why I thought, uh, why I tried to teach in Filipino. By Filipino, I mean, Tagalog developed, not in an artificial way, but because I, I believe that, well, in language, each language is developed by borrowing from other languages in a creative way. That's the way I look at it. When I was studying philosophy in Fordham, I had a fellow Jesuit who was studying English, and this fellow Jesuit told me that in Shakespeare's time, English was in a crisis because the educated people were talking Latin. And so when they tried to talk in English, they mixed Latin and English in a very, in a very promiscuous way, so to speak. And it took people, poets like Shakespeare, and some other poets, but especially Shakespeare, to mix Latin and English in a creative way. And so I thought to have a Filipino language which has, is able to express the Filipino genius for reality, one has to be able to use other languages in a creative, not borrowing, but stealing. I always say that when people ask me, how do you get your terminology? Well, to use the flexibility of Tagalog and, and some, when necessary, to use foreign words, but do not borrow foreign words, but steal. In other words, make it your own, and make it really your own. And so, in the 1960s, there was a lot of... Talk. Well, I was talking about the Filipino language, uh, which, which I thought was, at least the way I was trying to do it, was I was trying to use Tagalog, Tagalog in a way which uses, which is a creative way, tried, tried to have a creative way of using Tagalog in which the potential of the language itself can be flexibly used to express thoughts hitherto unexpressed in that language before and to steal foreign words, not borrow, but steal, make your own some foreign words if necessary, but do it in a creative way. 
And I don't mean to say that Tagalog is special, because I believe that I, I teach in Tagalog by the College Filipino because I was born and grew up in Manila, and we don't talk really Tagalog here. We, re, we there's, It's already there, mixed with all kinds of other languages and other words. If you are born in Manila, that's the Tagalog you pick up, and the temptation is to use a hodgepodge, and the challenge is to creatively make it a language, and that's what I was trying to do. But my roots are in Locarno, so I work out in Locarno, and I spent three years in Cebu, and I worked in Cebuano, and, and one year in Mindanao, and I work on Cebuano. So I think a, at least my own opinion, my own point of view is a Filipino should learn the language of the place in the Philippines where he is, is, stays and works. But I think that the language spoken in Manila has a certain practical use, use not, not to say this is the only language or the best language or anything, but it is a practical use. And if you are living in Manila, well, just like if you are living in some other place, your challenge is to use that language creatively. So if you're living in Manila, your challenge is to, to use that language creatively. And I believe that each language has got its own genius and has a contribution to world, to world uh, culture, so to speak. And so I'm not against English. English also has a practical use. And also, I think as many, uh, if a person can learn many languages, as many languages as one has. That's what the old Jesuit training taught me. We had to study Greek, we had to study Latin, and then we had to study English. And each one is a very creative language, and each one is able to express things which the other one cannot express. And each one makes life richer and increases the ability to understand other people. Because I think that when we speak of being having the option for the poor, one has to be able to speak to and understand, and understand that he doesn't fully understand. And I think that the tendency nowadays is to be organizational, administrational. And uh, which is also necessary, but I think it will be the administrational and organizational needs a human dimension, and that human dimension is found, I think, I think in the language. Now, in the 1960s, there was a kind of a, uh, activism and kind of because of Vatican II and because of the world history, the happenings in world history, there was a kind of uh, movements, all kinds of movements, Filipinization and all that. And I tried to take part in it, and I'm not very good at taking part in movements, so I'm, uh, the way I took part in it was a little bit confused. There was a time when I, I had a breakdown of some sort, and I, when I had a breakdown of some sort and I was out of teaching for two years, I was thinking. So I said to myself, if I ever go back to teaching, the thing is not to spend time confrontationally. Nothing happens when one confronts. What, is there anything I'm sure of? And I said, I'm sure that Philosophy in the sense of a subject where one tries to awaken people up to their ability to think, where one shares insights and tries to create a, an environment where thought is possible. That is important. But the language in which you do it is also important because each language has got its own genius. Reality is very rich and each language is able to be sensitive to reality in a way which is both true and original. So it's not a matter of 
competition, but a matter of if you are in a place to talking this language, know that language, love that language, use that, be creative in understanding and using that language. And I thought, if I did do that in a language, in a Filipino language, and since I am in Manila, in, in the language spoken in Manila, try to do that, just work at it, instead of making big discussions and whatnot. Because I thought to myself, if I just tell the Ateneo I want to teach in Filipino and so as not to have any discussion in the beginning, I said, just the core curriculum. All I want is that if I teach the core curriculum in Filipino, it will be recognized, it will be given units. And uh, the core curriculum will be only for volunteers. So we had some difficulty with the scheduling and we had, in those days, uh, they didn't schedule anything for it, so we had to look. But fortunately in those days there were, not like now there's no lunch break, in those days they had lunch break, so I would say volunteers to have this class during the lunch break or th things like that now. The logistics, there were some difficulty in the logistics, but basically it was possible to teach and to, in the beginning, and until now, we still have, because I remember when I was studying philosophy and theology, the courses were in Latin and the books were all in Latin, but many teachers were teaching in English using Latin textbooks. So I thought, I can teach in Filipino using English textbooks and gradually try to have some Filipino texts. So that's what I did, but Basically, I thought, do it, just do it, don't, if they, try to get them to let you do it. To what extent will they let you do it? And then they found out, they let me do it to, to an adequate and more than adequate extent. So now, it's no longer me blaming them because they stopped me, me blaming myself because I didn't do it, because there's a, a framework within which it's possible for me to do it. To do it, perhaps uh, not the best framework in the world, but there it is. So, and so once I settled there, that's I, uh, up to now. I'm trying to to bring out the potential of. But that's what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not trying to be original in philosophy or to give some terrific new insight in philosophy, but to help boys and young boys and girls to be aware I can think, I can see. Truth is important to me. That's, that, that's all. Father, it was an emotional period, no? when, when the Filipinization of the Ateneo and all that. Mm. Were, there some, were there some struggles that you, or problems that you want to mention during this interview that you had to face as you were trying to exert an effort to, to teach philosophy in Filipino? Well, I thought that the Ateneo was culturally American because the Americans were trying to make it a uh, verse. Uh, a replica of an American school. But the difficulty was they did it with the best will in the world and they were not aware that they were doing it. Although I think perhaps now they would be aware that with their emphasis on English. And uh, when I was studying in the Ateneo, we had an English rule. We had, you had to talk English all the time. By the time I was teaching it in college, there was no more English rule, but I think it was more because they had realized that it was unenforceable if they had an English rule, it could not be enforced. So, uh, that was the struggle because I thought that they had a policy which made Ateneo a preparation for studying in an American school and not a preparation for working in the Philippines. I thought that was what was happening and so I, th I was trying to sometimes be confrontational in, uh, in uh, pointing that out.
and I would be sometimes called a racist that I didn't like Americans, which is not true. Or that I don't like American things. Unlike most Filipinos, I like American things. <laughs> but it was just uh, the idea of looking at the school. But and I didn't know how to handle it. I'm not a very emotionally calm, collected person. So I, especially then in those days when I was young, I would sometimes become very, very passionate and in the process be say something unbalanced. But uh, then at a certain point when I realized confrontation is not it. You just do what you can do to the extent you're able to. And that was, as, as, as I said a while back, when I said, when I, when I had a breakthrough where I could have a, a core curriculum, that, that was a breakthrough because after that many other teachers in philosophy began teaching in philosophy. And then it was no longer just for, for volunteers, but you were given a time where, where you could teach in Filipino and where people could choose to teach it to a Filipino section. And very many chose it. And they love very many still choosing to do it in Filipino. So in a way, not completely, but, but uh, in, to some extent, the philosophy department is bilingual now. And uh, perhaps the whole school could be more bilingual, but I figure that's outside my, my competence. Well, my ability to, to bring that about is, 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 that's outside my ability to bring it about. But to the extent, to, to the extent that, that it can be done in philosophy, I think I'm doing it to the extent that I'm able to. But you're you're considered a, a terror. No? Uh, I mean, you hear uh, there are a lot of stories and myths about you, uh, how you how people are ter students are terrified of you, and yet you know uh, many students flock to your classes. Can you say something about this? No? I do not know really wh why. No, that they are afraid of me. I can know that because I look I look upon that as one of my difficulties in life. That I do get angry very. I I think. I, th I hope it's true. I think that it's not as bad now as it used to be. I, I, some people ask me, is it true you're mellow, mellowing? And I say, I hope so. <laughs> See, but I am very aware that I have a temper which is unreasonable. But sometimes it goes, it flies, goes out of hand. But when it comes to permanent decisions, I'm pretty uh, I try my best, and to the extent that I am able to, I think I succeed in not making any permanent decisions which are unfair. If I'm very angry at something, and then I, later on when I calm down, I realize it was unfair, I take it back. Then I realize it was fair, but the anger was out of proportion, the emotion was out of proportion, but the actual decision itself is fair. So I stick to the decision. So I try to be, uh, to be fair. And when I get angry, uh, when I'm no longer f angry, I try to examine it for fairness and try to follow what I think is, what I think is fair. So I don't know if that's one reason why many students still, when the course is finished, they thank me for it and whatnot. And I'm always surprised sometimes why as I say at the end of the class, thank you for your patience, I say at the end of the course. But uh, in a way I'm surprised, but well, if they thank me, of course, I'm, I'm very happy to be thanked. Uh, people, <laughs> yeah. There are also some stories about your uh, rather famous friendships with people like Rolando Tino, who was also a Filipinista. Um, so can you maybe talk about some of these people who were, I guess, uh, who believe the same cause as you did about uh, Filipinization in the other era? Well, R R Rolando is a is a genius of some kind, and uh, I do not know. It was more he who made friends with me than I who made friends with him. But when he made friends with, with me, I I noticed he believed not everything I believed, but 
basically we believe the same thing, perhaps with different nuances. And uh, insight, expression in the richness of a language, and that he knew that English was rich and Tagalog was rich. So those are the things I was also trying to work at. I, like when I use English, I try to use it as well as I can. And when I, any language I'm using, I, I don't pretend to be good at using the languages that I know, but I try to use it as well as I can. And that's the way Rolando is also. And he has a, a certain a certain passionate desire for excellence. I, I, I think there he is better than me because I have a passionate desire for excellence, but at a certain point I run out of energy. But he keeps going at it. Perhaps that's why he died young, I don't know. Father, when the battery is So, Father, um, I thought, I'd, given all the years that you've spent in the society, looking back, what would you consider some or a few of your uh, most rewarding experiences as a Jesuit? Well, I don't know if I can point to a particular experience, but uh, I can say there are some people who have formed me and uh, to whom I owe very much because of that, like Father Kohler and Father Banayan, for example. I, I was not yet a Jesuit at the time, but I think they've, they were already beginning my Jesuit formation in my friendship with them or in their friendship with me. And uh, I had a great novice master, Father Canali, who later on became Bishop Canali, and then also Father Socius, Father Faisi. I, I think both and then they were both training us during, forming us during war. And uh, strangely enough, even, even the war, now when I look back on it, it was some kind of a gift of God. And then all throughout the society, I have superiors which, who were always trying their best to be good. Sometimes, when I look back on it, I would say some of them are short-sighted or, or unable to understand or unable to empathize or too simple in their thinking. I, c I could trot it out. But of course now that I'm older, I'm not very eager to do that because I'm aware also of my own defects. But now I look back at my superiors and even those Americans who I thought were very dense. They were always trying their best to be good. And if I really was in any trouble, I would always realize the one treating me was treating me as a priest will treat another human being. But Jesuit priests, at least my experience of Jesuit priests, are basically their priests. They try their best, perhaps not very successfully sometimes, but always try their best to be priests. And uh, that's... I remember a fellow priest who asked me, if you die first, I'll give your homily, and if I die first, you give the homily. And I said, if I die first, you do what you want, because I'll be dead by then. But if you die first, I cannot give you a homily. I said, why? Because I don't give homilies unless I can say good things, and I don't know any good thing to say about you, I told him. But then after about two or three years, and uh, I went back to him and I said, you know, if you die first, I'll give a homily for you because I've discovered very many good things I can say about you. And I think and that, that, that guy was a superior. <laughs> and uh, so I think I can say that of all the superiors I have had. And uh, well, when I think of that, that's a grace. That's a grace. A grace for the superiors and a grace for me too. 
So. Uh, what about some some of the more difficult experiences that you have as a Jesuit here in the Philippines? Well, I guess the biggest difficulty I have is my own temperament. I'm a very temperamental person, and people find it hard to live with me, and and I find it hard to <laughs> to live with me also, and uh, so that's one. And the other one is I'm often misunderstood, but not with any bad will or anything, uh, and uh, I think that it makes it harder for me because. I know I am misunderstood, and I know that the person misunderstanding me has the best will in the world. And so, which reminds me again of one thing Father Delaney told me. He said, the basic injustice of this life is this. Some people do not understand you, and they oppose you, and they do stupid things. And when you both die, he's higher in heaven than you, because he has, he has more goodness than you. <laughs> Words to that effect, I'm not sure of the exact quotation, but I often remember, think of that. I, I don't, I think Delaney is a great, is, is a great Jesuit, and I don't want to put myself in the same level as him, but I think part of his difficulty in life, he was often misunderstood and by people who had goodwill, and the people who had goodwill were not aware on how stupid they were. But Delaney was aware they were stupid. And I sometimes have, have had people like that. Perhaps I should not use the word stupid, but misunderstand how short they were of understanding. But, uh, and I'm able to know that they are short of, misunder of understanding, but they, they don't know it. And they're good people. <laughs> and, uh, well, given your, your years in the society, if you were asked to formulate what it is you think uh, is the essence of being a Jesuit, how would you put that? I think to be a friend of Jesus Christ and to be a friend of Jesus Christ and of Mary and to be, to try your best to be, to have a keep alive a personal relationship with them and to no matter how dark things are to hold on to hope of course I, I'm teaching philosophy of religion and every year I read Marcel's uh, meditation on hope and so I can say that in a way it's an accident but for another way no I don't think it's an accident I think it's part of life and part of being a Jesuit that you go through moments of darkness and moments when things don't seem to have any meaning. And that if you are a friend of Jesus and of, through Mary, you hold on. I remember when I was a junior and uh, the first spiritual, one of our spiritual fathers was a, was a priest named Father Morning. He's an American. His name was Father Morning. And he was giving us points on meditation on the storm at sea when Jesus was asleep. And he said, this is a very important meditation because very often in life, things are very dark and the waves are very stormy. And the thing is to hold on. And sometimes we don't even know why we're holding on. But we just hold on. And I think that's it's one of the experiences of hope, that we don't know why we are holding on, but we are holding on. And I think that's, yes, to be a friend of Jesus and Mary, but that would mean also to be holding on. Father, um, you were very, you, you practically grew up with the Jesuits, also spent many years with them. And, uh, yeah, 57 years out of 74. <laughs> So I was wondering if you were asked uh, what you think, if there is you know, a distinctive role or contribution that the Jesuits have played here in the Philippines, what would you consider that to be? What, what, which of their works do you think has been the most important? I think there's one, 
with all our shortcomings and all our defects and all our stupidities, and I say our because I'm including my, I include I include myself in that. I have, I have got as as I grow older, I look back and I see my own stupidity also more clearly. There's a trying to be to empathize with people, I think, and they they are all there. Even the Jesuits before the war, the Jesuits before Vatican II, and the Jesuits now. If you look at the things which are being done, you can see many differences. But uh, there, there, there is always a kind of a trying to be, to empathize with people, not the idea that what people are, I always say yes to make them feel good. No, not, not that, but there is a real presence of Christ in every person that we come across, that we meet in every person we work with and deal with. There is a, uh, there's a presence of Christ already in him. And that's we and that's expressed in his special, unique way of being human. And we, we always try we don't have it in that formula, but I think we always try. I think that's part of the Jesuit the Jesuit uh, characterist character, I think it can be found even in other countries, and including our own country. I think that's the Jesuit character. Through all our shortcomings and everything, we, we always try to empathize with people. I think so. Uh, just two last questions. Uh, we're approaching the third millennium, so a lot of questions are being asked about where the society should focus its eyes on, where. In other words, which uh, mission area should the, the Jesuits be sent for the millennium? Would you have any thoughts on this, Father? I don't have any except that I think that the Philippine province has been groping for an answer. There was a time when, well, when the general asked for volunteer for Japan, there was one Filipino sent to Japan, Fernandez, and then another Filipino who later on left. And then there was a time when we were sent to Indonesia. There were three Filipinos sent to Indonesia, there were three Dutchmen. It was more to solve a problem because at that time the Indonesians were not allowing the Dutch to go there. So we had three Filipinos for the Indonesian province so that the three Dutch would come here. And, uh, and then they tried to send Filipinos to Korea and now to Cambodia. So I think the Philippine province has been trying to, f to discover where our mission is. And I think we will, f we will discover it sooner or later. But I think, although we, we are groping, good things have been happening. I think Fernandez has done a good job in Japan. And uh, Father Dees and Father Sanz and Father Natividad, I think they did the even for their short time in Indonesia, they did a good job and they learned a lot too. And among the Indonesians, the Dutch they sent here, the only one I got to know very well was Father Visker, and I think he was some kind of a saint, although he has died now. So in our groping, good things happen. And in Cambodia, there is this Richie Fernando, I, I, I don't know what, but I'm sure there there are and will be blessings coming to us because of his. It is heroic at the same time every day, you know. Yeah. Younger Jesuits. Yeah. Yeah. What do I have to say to the younger Jesuits? If that question is asked, I am very hesitant to try to answer it. But since it has been asked, I will try to answer it. First of all, I, I feel that my spontaneous feeling is this. I should not try to answer the question because your life is so, diver so different from the life I knew when I was young. It was so different. And uh, this world of globalization, where cable, cable TV, where you see what's going on in the other side of the earth, is so normal, so ordinary. Whereas when I was growing up, that would be 
even the concept was so incredible. Never, I never thought if somebody had told me about that when I was young, I would have said, oh, that's probably after I'm dead that will happen. But with you people, it's very normal, very ordinary. And uh, like the computer, all I know is word processing, but many of you can do all kinds of things with the computer. So if you ask me, what do I have to tell the young people? I, 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 I hesitate. But then there's one thing I can do, or try to do, as a teacher of philosophy, to awaken people to their ability to think and to see and to look for the truth. And that will be true no matter what the details of the looking for the truth are. Using it a computer, using cable TV, inventing all kinds of new ways of doing things, but to look for the truth. And the friendship of Jesus through Mary, I know that's a corny sounding slogan. And when I was young, when I heard that slogan, I thought it was corny. But now when I'm old, I, strangely enough, it was a young student who told me, I, who asked me some question and I said, the only answer I can give you is corny. And he said, and then I gave the answer, and then he said, oh, that's, but it's true, he said. The reason it became corny is because it's true. And I think the reason why that slogan, to Jesus through Mary, is corny is because it's true. And to try to live that in the context of the darkness which comes, comes with life. There's always a dark fringe to, to, the, to human life. And so a person holds on to the light which uh, it was Brother Alingal who, during the blackouts in Novaliches, caught a firefly and put it in the pocket of his habit so that wherever he goes, people won't bump into him and he won't bump into people. But then it can be used as a symbol of that no matter how weak we are, no matter how one thing we are, if we carry Jesus in our hearts, it's as if we have a fire, fire of life flickering in our breast pocket and people who see us receive some light anyhow, somehow or other. So. But, but that's, that's a lot of questions I have. Would you like to add anything just, just for any thoughts that come to your mind? Nothing. I just want to thank you for inviting me. Right. This is a nice experience.